Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Goodman with Art Matcher, the mobile app which will bring innovation to the art industry and is coming to you soon. While we work hard to build and release this app, we'll be talking art with some of the industry's most interesting and knowledgeable people. Whether you're an art aficionado or this is all new to you, we'll be here to provide valuable insight and hilarious good stories. Hope you enjoy our chat today. Hello, guys. Welcome to Art Match of the Podcast. I have a special guest in the studio today, friend, artist, Renaissance man can do it all. Don Davis, welcome to the show. Thank you. For what, a, what a kind uh, welcome. I appreciate that. You know, it's only for the best. Um, Don, can you tell the audience just a little bit about yourself so they could hear a little quick bio? Well, um, I have lived in Los Angeles for about the past 30 years, but I'm originally from Texas, just outside of Houston. And um, due to my father's uh, work uh, in the petroleum business, when I was a child, we lived overseas. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, in the early part of my life, till I was about seven, we lived uh, in Libya. Uh, we were actually there when Gaddafi took over. Oh, wow. And uh, a few years later, when I was 13, we spent some time in Egypt, a shorter period of time, uh, less than a year. And uh, the rest of the time, uh, we lived in Texas, and then I moved here to work in the film and television business uh, in 1990. Been here ever since. Oh, wow. So your transition, when did you start painting formally to the point where you, you say you took kind of art as a... It wasn't no longer a hobby. About 10 or 11 years ago is when I decided to, to get serious after having painted off and on uh, in the earlier part of my life, more off than on, but about 10 years ago. So, wow, 10 years ago. And it's interesting to me because when I think about when people initially get into painting, did you, did you tr explore any mediums before painting, like drawing, pastels? I never, I don't think I've ever asked, or I, I don't think I've ever even seen if you have uh, other stuff other than painting. Uh, no, I sort of jumped, jumped right in. Um, I'm not a particularly talented draftsman, uh, technically speaking. Uh, so that's probably why I didn't come to painting a little earlier in my life. I, I thought that that was something that I wouldn't be able to do. Um, Meaning I didn't like depicting when you say draftsman, are you talking about like the ability to paint like realism stuff of that sort to 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 draw in a more or less realistic fashion i i don't have that i think that's um a gene that people have and of course that talent can be honed i've never had any uh professional instruction of any kind and i'm <clears throat> pardon me i'm sure that skill could be um could be honed uh, but I don't have that, you know, some people without any uh, instruction at all can just pick up a pencil and draw beautifully. Uh, sure. Even if it's not particularly realistic, at least there's a style and you, you know, you can tell what they're trying to draw. I, uh, I just don't have that talent. So I thought uh, I just it never occurred to me to to try my hand at painting, although over the course of my life, I've been involved with um, other uh, creative areas. When I was a kid, I was a, a huge theater. I guess you'd call me a theater nerd. A theater uh, junkie. <laughs> well, uh, that was that was my that was the thing that I loved to do uh, the best. When I was a a child, I became fascinated with, uh, I would say, American pop culture. Uh, music and cinema, classic television. And I knew from a pretty early point in my life that I wanted to be involved in a creative endeavor in some way. And so that led me to be interested in theater, uh, probably from the age of 12 through the age of 20. That was my main form of artistic expression. In, in your theater practice, did you also sing? I never, I don't think... Because I know you you play music as well, right? 
I I did for for a while. I was uh, in a local band. Uh, a local. I I can sing, but what was your instrument of choice? I played the drums. The drum. Wow. Um, uh, percussion. <laughs> and and as a child, I, I I took some piano. I really wish I had that's stuck to the, it. I, yeah, I really wish. Someone, you could master the piano. You could do everything. Oh man, because because I'm a huge music fan, and uh, yeah, jazz piano is jazz piano. <laughs> something that uh, in my next life. Oh, you could. I mean, it, it's interesting the influence between uh, music and art. You know, I ask a lot of artists who come on, kind of, what do they listen to when creating their works? Um, I know you're a big jazz fan, and a lot of your paintings. They're the titles, aren't they derived from certain songs? Uh, oftentimes, I've noticed that when I'm coming to the point where I'm feeling like a painting is is finished or getting close to, to, to being finished, um, often a, a song title or a piece of lyric that I'm listening to at the moment will suggest a title. It's... Uh, it's very interesting that, that there can be that synchronicity. It's like, yeah, that's what this is supposed to be called. It's interesting when I think about, you know, uh, in your work, since it's abstract, when you're, when you're in the zone of painting, I know from my own experience, uh, starting off studying traditional art, like learning forms, figures, kind of, it was a lot of, honing on that ability you were talking about earlier, meaning your, your draftsman skills, like, can you depict something, you know, the way most people see it? And I thought to myself, you know, there's certain things when I was doing that, I wouldn't be able to listen to because it would break my concentration. But in terms of your process, is there something that lends a that really helps? Is it, you know, for some people it could be drinking, listening to music. Is there anything that is a crucial part of the process that you kind of indulge in, in that sense. That that helps sort of get the creativity flowing. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Um, well, uh, interesting that you hit on those two. Uh, a glass of wine uh, doesn't hurt. And I. it's interesting that we're talking about this because just recently I've started to find that listening to music of any kind um, can break my concentration. Uh, I think, and I'm not just a jazz fan, you know, uh, pop, rock, uh, lots of different genres, but I, I enjoy listening to jazz because a lot of the stuff I like is instrumental. And so there's no vocal to distract. To distract. You, you don't start listening to the lyrics and so forth, but uh, lately, I found that that even instrumental music. Some, sometimes I find myself painting in silence more and more often, and I can't really tell you why that is. Yeah, it's interesting for me when, at least, when I'm doing something that is, uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to replicate something. Uh, I, I can't, but I know there's a lot of artists like music is like it's a must in the studio meaning they can't operate without it. And it's interesting going to art school myself. There was always like kind of music playing in all the classes. Um, so it's interesting the relationship between those two arts, you know, visual and music. Yeah. Um, especially I think with uh, abstract art, there's something about uh, the, the improvisational nature of jazz music where yeah. uh, depending on the artist, uh, the, the song can go anywhere for any length of time. And, and it, uh, I think that helps just spark the idea that, that your painting can be as open and fluid as what you're listening to. Um, although, I, as I said, I've, I've been painting without music more lately, but then th sometimes the, the silence will, will need to be broken a bit. I just thought of this. So when you're painting, do you have a, an image in mind or a, a composition or a, co or, or a color scheme when you start the uh, painting? Or do you like, how do you go if we're trying to visually 
um, let the listeners have a visual of what your palette is. Do you, do you choose the colors ahead of time before tackling into the painting? You have an idea or, you know, can you kind of more talk on that? Yes. Um, every painting has to have a jumping off point. Um, you know, you, you've got to break that white canvas at some point. And, um, I will usually start with uh, a choice of colors. I'll have two or three. Do you work from a white canvas or do you prime it? Um, I, I, I prime it and, and will. But do you like prime it a color like a base, like a gray or a brown? Yes. Usually I'll get a, uh, away from the stark whiteness because okay. that's, uh, like I said, you. <clears throat> For me, the first uh, few applications are sort of taking ownership of the canvas, you know, making it become yours. Uh, that raw white canvas, it's, it, it's, you need to I, I, take ownership of it is, is the, the phrase that comes to mind and, um, and, and make it, um, Get to the point where you're you're starting to to let the image flow, and um, I, I will usually get rid of a, of the white and and go with like a yeah a gray or a light buff, just to kind of take the curse off a bit. Yeah, and I'm usually either working in the cool side of the spectrum or the warm side of the spectrum. Sometimes they cross over, but. Uh, and often I'll choose, uh, a technique that I'm going to work with either with, uh, brayers, the, the, the rollers that I use, which create a certain technique or, uh, other implements that create a different look with the paint. And I've decided that I'm going to attempt to work either with one of one or the other of those, although it, it often ends up getting blended together. Yeah, because I, I think about that because when I look at a lot of uh, abstract works, I think a lot of people, you know, and I think this is the media of it, you know, they think there's someone just throwing paint around like willy nilly type of deal about it. But, you know, knowing you and knowing how you go about your work, there's it's very methodical in various aspects. Yeah. Um, I think that some people draw the conclusion that, that abstract painting is, is, as you say, just moving some paint around on the canvas and, and calling it a day. And uh, I suppose that works for some people, but um, at least for my work, I, I, I feel like it needs to have some sort of internal logic, um, which is to say, um, you know, a, an abstract painting only has the meaning that the viewer puts onto it. And um, you could put 10 people in front of the same painting and some people are going to get something out of it. Some are going to love it. Some are going to hate it. And some are going to fall somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, an abstract painting doesn't necessarily have to mean anything, but I feel like it should look like it means something. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's it's it's interesting because if I'm looking at some some paintings and and I'm trying to I think a lot of people are interested in what was the artist trying to do? But when you're dealing with an abstract image, I mean, did the artist see that abstract image in their head and then create it? Possibly, potentially, it seems unlikely to me. Um, I think because the, there's so much, there's so much chance involved in the process itself. Like you could be, you could have a layer of paint underneath, and then you pull too hard, and then something seeps from the underneath. And it could be a happy, it could be a beautiful happy accident, or it could be a, just a terrible, like oh my god, I just ruined that needed to dry. I didn't want to see that. Mm -hmm. But no one would ever really know if that was. You know, we just assume. I think the more skilled you become, 
the more you can predict what's going to happen. Uh, but you're right. You, you, at least for me, you never know exactly what's going to happen. So I usually don't have uh, an idea in mind that's terribly specific of what it's going to look like. Uh, I'll have an idea and I'll have uh, an idea of the textures, but yeah, a, a lot of the joy of that type of painting is the discovery of, of uh, applying the paint and then uh, manipulating the paint once it's on the canvas and having something totally unexpected uh, occur or reveal itself that you never, that you never, never dreamed of. What are you working on now from in this past year in 2020, now we're in 2021, what have you been working on? Have you, have you decided it's interesting from the people I've talked to, a lot of people have changed, changed up their style. Did you think of doing that in this past year in the lockdown, still in lockdown? <laughs> No, actually, um, I started to work, uh, I, I've done several diptychs, started to work uh, with uh, two panels at once to, with the idea that they would be uh, seen and displayed together uh, as opposed to a single canvas. And also recently, I, I noticed that a lot of my work tends to uh, work best in the vertical axis, um, the, the portrait axis, yeah. up, up and down, in other words. And uh, I would find it difficult sometimes to uh, to create images in the horizontal axis or the landscape axis that that um, that I liked as much. And and recently I've been, I don't know if you'd call it a breakthrough, but I've been painting on that horizontal axis more and uh, discovering ways to to make that work because um, you know uh, an abstract painting is going to have a different balance when you uh, Willem de Kooning once said that uh, a great abstract painting should work in all four axes in other words any way you throw it around any any way exactly any way you you hang it uh, and that's quite a challenge. All four, I've I've done that maybe once or twice, where I I was really happy with with no matter how you looked at it. Usually, uh, I'm I can be happy with with one horizontal axis and one vertical axis, but you couldn't necessarily flip the horizontal upside down and have it work as well because the balance is going to be different and the weight is going to fall visually on a different part of the canvas and what what looks good one way is not going to necessarily look good uh, well i find the larger you go it's more forgiving in that sense um because the eye has to travel on a larger surface versus if you're working i find it very challenging to create a small abstraction because everything's in hyper focus when you can because one of the beauty about like some of these abstract artists like Pollock is the size, uh, Rothko, the size, like, whoa, mm -hmm. uh, Rothko, on the other hand, it's, it's interesting. Cause he probably, a lot of people go, oh, I could have done that. <laughs> Cause they're just, they're looking at something that seems very simple. It's aesthetically at least it is, but it's incredibly profound. Yeah. And, um, it took Rothko years and years and years to, to, come to his mature style, his signature style. Uh, and, and you're right. So there, there's something profound about that simplicity. Uh, and it, yeah. it, it does, it, it does seem like one of those things that, that, uh, a person could look at and go, I, I, I could, I could do that. Or, or my child could do that. Um, and finding that type of signature style and that, that kind of uh, simplicity is it's it's like uh, it's like juggling or um, well you know this you know the interesting thing when you start tackling certain works especially when you scale up is you know you need the space to do it we've always talked about this you've told me you know if you had more space you'd go much larger 
And the biggest format you've done was through a triptych series, right? It was when you're combining three canvases. Yes. But on a singular canvas is the biggest uh, 40 by 70, 48 by 72. Is that the largest or 48 uh, by 60? Yeah. Uh, no, no, 48 by 72, I think. You know, it's interesting. One of the paintings um, I sold of yours, which I think was one of the largest formats, was this painting where you had used crushed coffee. Mm -hmm. For texture? For texture. It was like this. It was interesting because we couldn't really pin the color on it. And I got to get you a photo of it because it's it's so funny because in certain lights it looks blue and certain lights it looks green. Um, What made you start experimenting with different uh, foreign mediums like that? Because, well, I was interested in ways to build up the texture um, without just using paint and medium. And uh, in my reading about uh, Pollock, for example, he um, he was apt to to use foreign matter. Um, crushed glass, um, just anything he would pick up, a, a cigarette butt, a bottle cap, he would uh, introduce it onto the canvas to give the, the paint something to grab onto rather than just hitting the canvas. It it, uh, it gave some texture and, and gave the paint something to, to adhere to and kind of build up on. So I decided to uh, try the same idea. Now, but now in, in your recent works, you, you, you don't, you don't do so much of that as anymore, right? No, no. Um, I experiment more with the, with the paint itself and, uh, various mediums to, to thicken it up and, uh, experiment more with the, the viscosity and so forth, because, uh, how thick or thin, the paint is, and we're talking about acrylic paint. Yeah. Um, it will dry faster. It'll dry tackier and you'll, you, you can build up, uh, the surface area, um, you know, without having to, to mix things in. Do you look at a lot of other artists for inspiration? Cause uh, obviously you, you're, you're a fan of Pollock, you're a fan of Rothko, de Kooning. Um, well, yeah, the, the, but do you draw inspiration from them in terms of taking a little bit of their flavor and and put it in your own or doing it in your own way? Yeah, uh, I would say that it's the the New York School, the Abstract Expressionists are the it was that group of painters, um, and there's there's so many of them that that don't get the credit that they're due. They're, the the big names that people know are. Pollock and Rothko and de Kooning and uh, Franz Klein, Barnett Newman, um, Joan Mitchell, yeah. uh, Elaine de Kooning, uh, Lee Krasner, and then but there's a there's a whole uh, subgroup of people that, that don't get as much attention, and that's the 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 group that I think inspires me most to paint. Of course, I love paintings from all different eras. Uh, you know, impressionism, some pop, uh, the Dutch masters, all of that. But it was it was the abstract expressionist that uh, made me want to see if I could create images that were as um, arresting and beautiful and powerful as they did. But um, I realized pretty early on that uh, I didn't want to incorporate anyone's style or look too much because, uh, for example, uh, the drip and splatter technique that Pollock is most famous for. Uh, he took that technique and made it so recognizable that now it's inextricably identified with him. If you see someone do the drip and splatter technique, it immediately makes you think, oh, that's that's Pollock, even if it's not the whole, you know, that's not all the painting is, even if it's just sort of the background uh, for something else. So I made uh, the decision a long time ago to not use that. Not because I don't love it, I, I do. I think it was an incredibly innovative breakthrough, but he took that and made it his own. So 
Um, but would you say then he has the market? Cause that's an interesting thing. You know, a lot of people can use drips within their painting and then they automatically go Pollock. I mean, I know some other ones like, uh, Sam France, uh, Francis. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work. He has like these trippy works mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I don't think of Pollock when I look at his paintings, funny enough, but yes, Pollock has this distinct anytime. Yeah. Anyone sees a drip painting, they say, Oh, if they're informed Jackson Pollock, but I would say if someone's informed about your work, they're just going to say, Oh, Gerhard Richter. Well, uh, I have heard that. Um, and it's funny the the thing that I think reminds those uh, who are reminded of Gerhard Richter about my stuff uh, is the use of a of a, the the technique of applying paint to the canvas and then using a in his case he uses a, a rubber squeegee uh, but any kind of long flat sided implement to take the paint and pull it across the pull canvas. It, yeah. Um, once it's been applied, then it's manipulated. And I came across that technique, um, on my own. I, I was relatively, I, I, w I was less familiar with, with Richter's work than I have become since then. And one evening early on, um, uh, a number of years ago, I, uh, took a, a flat piece of wood and, and mixed a couple of colors together on the canvas and and pulled the paint across and, and it made a beautiful effect and I feel I feel like I discovered that for myself. Yeah. Obviously Richter discovered it decades before me and I'm sure people uh, discovered it before him. I doubt he was the first uh, painter to, to to discover that technique. I think he sort of like Pollock was the, the dripping uh, drip and splatter had been done before. But Pollock was the first one to take that single technique and, and take what had been an ingredient in previous paintings and make the whole meal out of it. You know what I mean? He, he Well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we we start to identify certain certain artists with certain styles. You know, we have Picasso with Cubism. We have Brock, Cuba, you know, we have these, you know, we have Pollock with the splatter, we have Gerhard Richter with the, the pulling, like there's just certain people it pays to be the first. And I wanted to come to this part where like, if you are along, if you are around long enough using a technique and you just so happen to be the first, like today in 2021, anyone can say something's derivative, you know, there's just, there's so much art out there. And I think so many artists focus on identifying with a style, especially abstract artists. Like one of the things I'm seeing a lot on social media is artists, abstract artists who are doing spin paintings with a drill. So they take a drill, they, they have like a wood and they essentially spin out the canvas. And a lot of these guys, they're discovering this for the first time. They're not in the art world. They're kind of more like hobby painters. And it's interesting. They're not like informed about Damien Hirst's like spin paintings or anything like that. Or, and, and it's interesting because they have that euphoric probably feeling like, wow, no one has ever done this. Or, you know, one is influenced by another guy and saying, I could do this too. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's interesting to me going back to that feeling when you first discover a technique on your own that wasn't in You didn't know of Gerhard Richter at the time. You were just learning, let's say, how to manipulate the medium or, or work with the medium. It was in, in very much a heavy, heavily experimental phase because it was all new. That was so long ago that, that everything you tried uh, was being tried for the first time. Yeah, and it's interesting, that feeling, because I went through a traditional kind of art training where you're learning about these different techniques, how to achieve certain things, you know, there's scumbling, there's dry, there's just all these techniques. So someone like me, who's informed on these techniques, I don't get that excitement of discovery because it was like taught, this is what you use it for. This is how you, this is going to help you make a tree. This is going to help you make a texture of a ground. Kind of like, have you seen the joy of painting with Bob Ross? Oh, sure. I know. 
Okay, so you know that was you know he was he was teaching these techniques essentially how to make Mm -hmm. these uh, landscape paintings, but it's it's interesting um, thinking about that discovery period when you discover something for the first time. When's the last time in your practice now you've kind of or have you not recaptured that from that kind of discovery phase of discovering a, a new technique. So I guess my question is, have you discovered new techniques uh, recently in your practice? I wouldn't say I've discovered new techniques, uh, but I'm always discovering new ways to combine techniques uh, and, and not just use one or the other, but, but blend them together. Um, I guess it's been a while since I've had that flash of, wow, that's, that's incredible. I have to remember how to do that. But, um, I think I'm, uh, more learning how to, to, to combine the techniques and how to, um, use the canvas, uh, not necessarily as, as one overall, work, but, uh, creating zones within the canvas, uh, if that makes sense and, and, and breaking it up and, and almost thinking, uh, I have in the past and, and currently experimented with the idea of part of the painting being heavy on one technique and part of, uh, uh another part of the canvas being predominantly uh, another technique so that um, if you know how to read it, know how to read the, the, the finished work, uh, you can see that, yeah, th- th- this part utilizes a technique that I see over here, but on this part of the canvas, another style, not another style, but another technique is predominant. Because it's interesting when I think about work, um, I see a lot of art. And I find like after artists kind of achieve success in um, a style or narrative, they it's hard to break out of that mold. And for me as an artist, as a creative, I don't want to be creating the same imagery. Ideally, I want to be creating new imagery. So like an example of is like if you take an artist like Alec Monopoly, for instance, who uses the Monopoly man, you're familiar with his work. I've mm-hmm. shown you. Um, I would just get bored of repeating that imagery or using, you know, and, you know, some people say, oh, that's good because then we can identify his work. Like, oh, he's known for just putting a Monopoly man and everything. But to me, the idea of a Monopoly, like, you know, it's just. How many times can you do that? How many times can you do that? And as an artist, are you having fun with it at that point? You know, because it's like. Am I having fun with what? No. So like, it's, it's interesting going to your work, you know, that's why I was asking about kind of like that flash of you discovered a new technique. I'm all about like, for me, it's, it's not so much that. I move away from techniques. I'm trying to think about my work conceptually. Like, what is this trying to say? What does this mean in the world we're living in? Maybe it's a little philosophical in that sense. Um, And I have the luxury where I can use various techniques because I've studied different technical aspects. But being in the abstract realm and kind of mastering kind of your, your style and ability, do you ever get to a point where you're like, wow, I want to do something like I want to do something else. Does that make sense? Like, sure, sure. Um, and we have, we've spoken about this in the past. Um, I have experimented with, uh, in various ways, introducing imagery into my, um, work uh, I think you, you asked me if I jumped right into painting. Um, I, I, I did, but early on I experimented with with figurative work. Um, realized fairly quickly that that's, that's not my ultimate forte, but I do 
uh, I've always wanted to and continue to experiment with with introducing um, recognizable imagery that is not necessarily drawn or painted by my hand. In other words, uh, use of photography, collage, um, because like I was saying before, a, a, a purely abstract painting, um, it can make a person feel an emotion or, uh, you know, it can make you feel happy, sad. Uh, it, it can have a, you know, calm quality, turbulent quality, but, um, without the introduction of, of, uh, fairly, um, specific imagery, uh, you know, you, you're not going to get someone to think of, you know, a, a, a 1930s Hollywood film, for example, without yeah. introducing, uh, you know, a, an image that sort of pushes people in that direction. Does that make sense? And, yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, that makes sense. And it's, I just chose that, uh, uh you know, uh, you, you're not going to make, it, it's hard to, for example, if you have a, we're in a, a, a pretty politically volatile time right now, unless you introduce, you know, an image of a, of a policeman with, uh, you know, a, a, a gas mask on or something like that, or, or a, a, a protester holding up a banner, uh, you're not going to get, people aren't going to go, well, well, this, this has a political bent to it. If it's totally abstract, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, no, it does. I think it's, it's interesting how certain images pop out, um, to us more so than other images today. You know, there's a lot of recycled images, like you could very well be introducing, um, iconic images like Marilyn Monroe or Barack Obama. It could be anyone who people recognize. And I think about artists who have been able to successfully kind of and in, in reinvent it, meaning you have Warhol, who obviously that was part of his body of work, just depicting celebrities, pop art, you know, mm -hmm. um, but you have an artist like Shepard Ferry who comes around, you know, when Obama was uh, running for president and then creates this iconic image. And now we know it as like hope. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a powerful image. Um, he referenced a photographer's work, but made it in his own right with his color scheme and his style. And he has this very graphic type of style. And it's, it's amazing how, you know, powerful and how that kind of, um, you know, allows people to resonate with the work and be familiar with it. I think it's interesting today in the, in the abstract landscape, I think the generation today, um, as creative and as imaginative they are in other mediums, I don't think they're as, they have the patience to look at it as much in painting today. Does that make sense? Meaning you could, they could watch something that's really cool on a, on a, on a video, like people's attention span. Cause so many people, you know, we used to joke around, you know, if you, you would tell me if, if someone puts their painting behind a couch and your painting behind their couch in their living room, that's a compliment in a way, meaning it's in their house, right? Yes. As far as my own work. Yeah. Oh, the, to me, that's, <coughs> pardon me. That's about the highest compliment that, that I feel like I could be paid. If someone uh, looks at one of my pieces and feels like that's something I would like to have in my home, that's something I could live with. Uh, yeah, because, uh, but there's that term where people say, Hey, I don't want to make a couch painting. You've heard that. Yeah. And I, you, you have a pause, you know, it's so interesting. I, I, I agree with you if it makes it inside someone's house, but this is where I'm going back to that last trend of thought, meaning a lot of people, the work that's in their house, let's say, you know, let's for use this term couch paintings, right? Do they really focus on what they have? 
um, I learned several years ago, I had an abstract piece that I, I had given to my cousin. He was holding on to it for me. It was nothing. I just created this abstract image. It was nice, colorful. It matched his decor. I was going for um, literally to match his decor. So I had it in mind. He had a, he had a very unique wall that was painted and, and I made sure the paintings fit in the space. Make a long story short, he moved spaces and he, he kept the paintings and I never kind of was on it to get them back. But about a year ago or so, I said, hey, you know, can I get those paintings back? And he had grown an emotional attachment to that. Meaning he said, no, 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 I, I need the paintings. Like, mm-hmm. And it was interesting because I know on the day to day, he doesn't look at them, but he knows in the absence of them, <laughs> there would be something detrimental. <laughs> No, it's it's grown to be part of um, his space, his yeah. comfort zone. Um, there is a, a term that you come across if you if you read do any reading about art, you're going to come across this pretty quick. And the the term is decorative. Decorative. Yeah. And for most people, at least in 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 my in my uh, experience, oftentimes that term is uh, uh, pejorative. It's not considered a compliment. It's it's it, 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 people look down on decorative art. And when I thought about it, when I think about it, some of the greatest artworks ever created were specifically intended to decorate homes, uh, public spaces, churches, cathedrals. I mean, that was the point was to uh, take a space and, and, and add to it and, and make it more beautiful and more powerful than it was before. So I don't consider that to be a bad word. Um, and of course it can be, uh, I, I guess it can be, uh, you know, uh, it can be taken, I guess, too far, but I, I don't know. I, 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 I appreciate when someone um, admires one of my paintings enough to want to take it into their home because that, to me, that's, that's a, a high compliment. I, I, I think being familiar with your work, there's a lot, there's a lot that people can miss just looking on the surface of looking at the image. Meaning when I show someone an image of your work, they go, oh, you know, but it's like when they get to see it in person and they see the the texture, the, the nuance. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, the physicality of it, it's a, it's a very different experience. And I think you can, a lot of people, you know, initially, especially today in the digital world we're living in, they fall in love with an image first, you know, through a digital screen. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, from having shows, we've done several shows, it's amazing that the, just the experience in person. And sometimes I feel a lot of people can take that for granted, meaning they have a painting on their wall, right? They see the image, they, they're they looking at it as if the image. But if you, for me, I when I, when I get looking at your work, I get up and close, I'm looking, you know, looking at, you know, there might be a sharp texture where the paint dried and, it could, you know, if you touch it, it could almost cut you and stuff. Um, I think I have been cut on your work before. Yeah, there's some sharp edges. Some sharp edges on the sides. And I and I I just wonder, I I know from being in the business of distributing and and having these relationships with clients, a lot of them they don't have that relationship, meaning where they're looking at the artwork really heavily. Meaning I could have sold them on, on the image, they like the image, the image comes to their house. They look at it and they just, you know, just, they go about their rooms of like, do you know what I'm saying? It's just like an image up on the walls that they know it fills the space, and which is a compliment to you. Cause you're like, oh wow, my work is in someone's house, but I don't think they're appreciating it to the level that you put into it in the way well, kind of um, you look at art. I, 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 I would I, I think in the absence of recognizable imagery in my work, um, I feel like the, the, the trade-off is 
that level of of nuance. And uh, I, I do feel like that the best of my work is it's like a great piece of music. Uh, you can come back to it and listen to it uh, over and over and over again and still get something new or, or a great film that you can watch more than, you know, many times and always get a little something uh, more out of it. Um, I think my paintings stand up to repeated viewings. Uh, and I love the, 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 I just love the tactile quality of paint and the way that, uh, it, it can be layered and colored and manipulated to the point where there's always something, something new, d depending on the light, you know, the way the light hits it, the light in the morning, the painting's going to look one way, the lighting in the afternoon, it's going to look another way under artificial lighting, as opposed to, uh, natural light. I feel like that, that my paintings are, I, most of the walls of my house have my own stuff on it. And some of those paintings have been up for years and I still find myself, um, looking at them and observing them and finding new things that even I had never seen before. On that note, where can the people find these paintings? Can you, uh, tell the audience your Instagram, your website? Um, well, my website is dondavisart.com and, uh, my sadly under tended Instagram account is Don underscore Davis, uh, underscore art. Um, we, we haven't even touched on social media, uh, and my, my love, hate, hate relationship with social media. We'll have a whole discussion on that. Yeah, that's, um, that's a, that's a whole ball of wax, my friend. This is just the, the introductory Don. Thank you so much for coming in. I know time goes by so quickly. Can't wait to have you on again. Thank you so much for coming into the studio. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into the Art Matcher podcast. We had an interesting discussion, a great time, and we hope you did too. Please tune in for next week's episode and like, share, and follow. For more information about the app, you can check out our website at artmatcher.com or look us up on social. Stay safe and be artful.